Good evening and uh, welcome to our Robertson School speaker series for the first time uh, today in a virtual format uh, because of the circumstances that we all find ourselves in. Uh, my name is Marcus Messner and I'm the director of the Robertson School of Media and Culture here at VCU. Um, our entire team is excited to welcome you to our event this evening. We're very excited to have our star alum, Aaron Gilchrist, as our speaker this evening. He's not only a graduate from our school, um, he also used to teach journalism classes for us as an adjunct professor. And I actually had the pleasure to teach alongside him many years ago uh, in one of my first classes uh, here as a professor at VCU. Uh, we look forward to an enlightening and engaging conversation with Aaron and hope that you will also contribute to the discussion on social media tonight. Uh, please post your questions via Twitter by using the hashtag VCU Robertson um, or post in our Q&A feature here um, in the Zoom webinar. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Mallory Perryman. Uh, Dr. Perryman has been an assistant professor in the Robertson School since 2017 and serves as a coordinator of our journalism sequence. Uh, she also regularly directs our signature broadcasting program, VCU Insight. And Dr. Perryman recently published her first book titled Mediated Democracy, Politics, the News and Citizenship in the 21st Century. The book looks at the health of democracies and relationships between citizens, journalists and political elites. Before Dr. Perryman starts us off with an introduction of our speaker, um, I would like to ask you all to mark your calendars for our next speaker series event on October 6th. Uh, when we will welcome a panel to discuss the topic of race, media, and the 2020 election. We will publish more details about that forthcoming event in the coming days. And with that, I now turn over the microphone to Dr. Perriman. Have a wonderful evening here at the Robertson School Speaker Series. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Mesner, for organizing this and making it happen, even though we can't be together right now. We will be again eventually. And I'm glad that we can still have these conversations in new and exciting ways. Um, so I am here to get to talk with Aaron Gilchrist. And unfortunately, Aaron and I did not cross paths at VCU or in Richmond. He left before I got here. So I'm getting to know him alongside all of you tonight. Um, the first thing you need to know about Aaron to get excited about him is that he is a homegrown talent. He's from Richmond, he's a journalism major from the Robertson School, like Dr. Mesner mentioned, he even taught for us. He spent a decade at NBC 12 here in town, started as a desk assistant, and worked all his way up to morning anchor. And for anyone who's not well versed in how TV newsrooms work, that's not just one promotion. <laughs> that's like a um, intern to stop the company. Um, so it's not surprising that Aaron ultimately jumped to one of the biggest TV markets in the country. Um, he started at News 4 in 2010, and he worked there as a weekend morning anchor and a general assignment reporter. And since 2012, he's actually been at the helm of the desk on weekday mornings. He's an anchor there. Um, over his career, he's worked uh, tons of political events like the Iowa caucuses, uh, the national conventions for both Republicans and Democrats. Um, he's been at the desk for a couple of big elections, the inauguration of Barack Obama, the funeral of Ronald Reagan. Um, unfortunately, he's also had to cover a lot of disasters. He reported on everything from Hurricane Katrina to the mass shooting at Virginia Tech. He's seen plenty of blizzards and tropical storms. Um, and through it all, he's earned a lot of experience. Um, he's built trust with viewers and hopefully he's gained a little bit of wisdom that he can share with us tonight. So welcome, Aaron. Um, we're very, very proud to have you talking to us tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm, I'm sad I can't be there in Richmond. I was looking forward to coming home back to VCU, but uh, I'll, I'll be there to visit as soon as it's, it's okay to do that. We'll be happy to have you back in a big auditorium where we're all sitting shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> You're right. It's insane now. I mean, I, I can't even fathom that. So I, you know, I want to talk to you first about your professional journey. You started in Richmond. You got it, got all the way to DC. But take us back to when you were deciding to go to college. Did you know you wanted to be a journalist? Did you know you wanted to go to VCU? I mean, how did you end up in the Robertson School? I did. I, I did know a lot of that coming out of high school. Um, I was I was pretty fortunate. I think that I've been pretty fortunate through the course of my career. Um, I started the Richmond Public School System has uh, a cable channel, the educational access channel on cable, 
And I actually started working there. It was the, the school district's public information office ran this TV station, really, uh, out of City Hall there in Richmond. And uh, they produced a few programs a couple of times a week, uh, some just around things that were happening in the schools. And so, you know, people laugh sometimes when I say I started at the Educational Access Channel. Um, it's really where I learned how to look into a camera. It's, it's not even something you think about um, until you're in that situation where, you know, I, the first time I was in front of a the camera, there's a cameraman behind the camera. And I kept looking at him instead of looking into the camera, uh, you know, as a teenager. Um, it was where I learned just the basics of, of broadcast performance, the, the performance part of our job. Uh, reading from a teleprompter, which is not necessarily an easy thing to do if you don't have the experience with it. I learned how to read from a teleprompter, and I learned how to, to, to sort of do the foundational part of writing. Um, I was really long-winded as a writer <laughs> starting out, and I had a great mentor uh, in Stephen Bolton with the Richmond School System, who's passed away now, but he, uh, he slapped my hand when I was doing a little too much typing <laughs> early on. <laughs> so you had interests even as a high school student and then once you got to VCU I assume you were already in the you were always in the broadcast path and you knew you wanted to be on air. Yeah I did. Um, I started I uh, came into VCU as a, as a mass communications major and uh, knew that I wanted to work in TV news. I actually started working at the NBC station in Richmond in October of my freshman year. I uh, needed a part-time job, and it was the best station in town, and, and still is as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and so I went and applied for a production assistant job, uh, not completely understanding what the job entailed, but it was where I wanted to work, and, and there was a, a way in, I thought. Uh, the person who interviewed me was very nice and <laughs> told me that I was underqualified for that job, but uh, he would pass my resume on to the news department. Uh, and then an editor position came up in, in the news department. And uh, Paul Otto, who used to be the director of, of what was then the School of Mass Communications at VCU, um, uh, put in a good word for me. She had been a news anchor in Richmond, and, and she had been my mentor. Uh, I still went to Richmond Community High School required students to do a mentorship. And so I did my mentorship under Paula, and, and she was a new professor uh, at VCU. And, you know, just sort of knowing people and making those connections and, and actually knowing how to edit uh, back when it was still tape to tape. <laughs> uh, I was able to, to land that, that entry, you know, minimum wage position part time at Channel 12 and work my way up from there. Well, I think you're mentioning something really important, too, for students to remember, and that's, you know, every connection, every impression that you make. I mean, it, it got your foot in the door and then somehow you ended up with an on air job. <laughs> From a desk? You, you know, it was, I, I started, as I said, as an editor, and I think within six or seven months, I was on the assignment desk on weekends, which at that time, to be perfectly honest, was answer the phone, uh, you know, you're sort of an intermediary between the, the crews that are in the field and the producer before she came in, and, and again, we were doing things on tape, so I had to roll the feeds for the, for the, uh, the video that was coming down from the network. Uh, and I chose to make it a little more than that. Um, the reporters who worked weekends, uh, God bless them for putting up with me, but you know, I was, every time I heard something on a scan, I was calling the reporter and saying, hey, check this out. Uh, and it's where I learned, it's where I learned news judgment, just being in that newsroom by myself sometimes on weekends, having to make decisions, having to make phone calls and, and gather more information uh, and, and then relaying that to people who can make decisions. It was really where I really learned the basics of a news judgment, um, and and yeah, and on up from there. Uh, I think we had we did uh, little local news updates during the Today Show on the weekend, uh, and at that time I think we taped. Well, I think we did some of it live and some of it was on tape. In any case, it was an opportunity for me to get some airtime, and so I, I really really pushed hard on the executive producer and the woman who managed production assistants and uh, desk assistants, I should say, uh, and, and the news director, and they were willing to give me a shot. And, you know, I, Nancy Kent, Frank Jones, <laughs> Bonnie Talbert, they, they took a chance on me early on. I was 19 when I started doing some on work there. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you know, I kept raising my hand. I was in the newsroom as much as I could be, whether I was working a shift or not. It was, 
you know, exposure and, and still answering the phone or making copies or whatever it was that needed to be done, uh, just to make an impression and, and to say, yeah, I'm here and I'm willing to learn and I'm willing to work. Uh, and I like to think that it, it made a good impression on, on folks who were making decisions. It's also a good thing when somebody, when they put your face on TV and then somebody says, hey, we need to see more of your face on TV. Yeah, it's a great thing. And it doesn't always happen that way. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. <laughs> so eventually you, I mean, now, now you're in the, the DC market, which is a massive media market. I mean, uh, uh, Richmond's isn't so small itself. I mean, a, a job in Richmond out of, out of college is actually a very good market. I think we're market 54. Um, out of you know 213 or however many there are now, um, so it's it's pretty it's a pretty good job on its own. But to go up to DC is, I mean that's it doesn't get much bigger than that. Did you did you want that bigger market feel? Uh, I did. It wasn't. I was actually uh, I'd been anchoring the morning news in Richmond. I think six years uh, in which I left um, and was happy doing what I was doing in my hometown. Uh, at the best TV station, doing, uh, telling stories about uh, what was happening in the community that, that I knew so well and, and where I grew up. Um, so I was, I was happy in Richmond, and an opportunity came up in D.C. And uh, some of the folks who were managers in D.C. at the time uh, reached out to me and said, hey, uh, we're interested, come talk to us. And we talked about what opportunities there, there were at that time and what the future might look like. And, and it just seemed like the right time after 11 years at Channel 12 in Richmond, it seemed like the right time to, to stretch and, and spread my wings and, and see what else I could do. And now you've put in over a decade um, in your new spot. Yeah, and it's been, it's been great. You know, I, I, going into a bigger market, I think when I left Richmond, Richmond was market 58, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, and DC was market, I think, eight at the time. Um, so it was a pretty significant jump. In, in terms of, you know, and sort of how we as, as broadcast journalists think about markets. Uh, it was a pretty big jump. Uh, and so, you know, it was a little scary at the time to think about, um, you know, being a little fish in a really big pond <laughs> in comparison to where I was. Uh, and I was lucky to come into a newsroom where people understand, understood then and still understand now that it's a team effort. And when one person succeeds, the whole team succeeds. It's a really competitive business that we're in, but you also have to recognize that it's an ensemble effort, um, that there's no one person on the team who's more important than anybody else. Uh, I know sometimes people make jokes about the, the talent, the, the people who are on air. Um, and, and the reality is nothing that we do on air could happen without all the people who are behind the scenes making the decisions and making calls and, 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 you know, it's our job to make the presentation, but all that work that happens behind the scenes is, is the real heavy lifting. Yeah, for every one person you're seeing on camera, you know, there's what, five or six probably per talent um, doing the work behind the scenes. And a lot of our students end up in, in those jobs that are so important. And there's a lot of collaboration that you, you don't realize until you're in it. Um, tell everybody what you, what do you do? Like, what does a typical day look like for you? Because it, it starts really early for you. Yeah, it does. I've worked mornings most of my career. There was a little stretch here in D.C. Uh, where I worked nights. And in Richmond, I think I worked days for a little while, but mostly mornings for you know, the 20 years that I've been working in, in, in TV news in front of and on camera. Uh, and so now my morning starts uh, at about 2.30, 2.45 when that first alarm goes off. And then the second or the third alarm go off. Uh, and you know, I, I, I'm at work by 3.30, um, and we, our show starts at 4 uh, every morning. So it's, you know, very quick. You know, I come in and, and read over as much of the, the content as I can just for, you know, for comprehension, for, for pronunciation, that sort of thing, to make sure I can pronounce everything. Uh, and then you know, make up, and, and we're on TV at 4 a.m. for three hours. Uh, I have a great co-anchor in Onion now, and, and we've been uh, a happy team together for, for the last eight years. You do your own makeup? I do. It's, and <laughs> it's, a, it's a sore spot for some of us. <laughs> but yeah, you know, and, and you know, I did in Richmond too. It's just one of those things that comes with a job. You know, men figure out how to, how to do makeup, and it's not, uh, it's not a vanity thing. It's, uh, 
you know, there are practical reasons that, that we don't want to be shiny on camera and, and there are practical reasons that, you know, you don't wear, you know, loud jewelry and, and you know, I'm against, I'm just, just my wedding band and, and, and a watch and, and that's the extent of it. And it's so you don't create unnecessary distractions. At least that's the way I've always thought about it. And HD cameras are, are pretty unforgiving, so. Hey, you know, I remember the time before HD and, and that morning we made the switch over. I remember that. <laughs> it was a hard day. <laughs> You're thinking, I never knew my pores were this big. <laughs> yeah, every single one. That's, that's how it worked. Um, so let's talk about how things have changed a little bit for you during the pandemic. You were telling me before we started, you've been doing some remote reporting. Everybody's sort of, I remember when this first happened, I was watching the Today Show and Savannah was um, anchoring from her basement and Hoda was in the studio and they only had Hoda on set. Now they've got them both on set, but they're like eight feet apart. And yeah. it's been, everyone's been just sort of trying to figure out how do we make this work? So what is, what does your newsroom look like right now? What's everybody doing? So uh, we're, we're, we're doing the same thing where a lot of people, a lot of our staff work from home now. Um, we have, you know, so for our morning show, for our writing team, pretty much our entire writing team is working from home now. We have uh, maybe three producers in the building. Um, uh, for our morning show, where usually we would have probably four or five um, that are doing different things and, and as far as the on-air folks, you know, uh, we have two anchors in the building for our show. A third uh, anchor, sort of a breaking news anchor, is working from home. Our reporters and photographers do not come into the building anymore for anything. I think the photographers maybe they need to get some gear, but they have a certain area where they go and they're not in the newsroom anymore. All of our the station's business functions, I believe, are, are remote now. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's the reality of the world we live in. The safest way for any of us to function is with distance. And so to keep as few people in the newsroom as possible is the best way to, to maintain a lot of distance. It's, it's weird sitting on the anchor desk now and my co-anchor who used to be, you know, less than arm's length away from me is now clear on the other side of, of a really large desk. Uh, and you know, it's just, it's that new normal that everybody's dealing with. Uh, and you get it, I mean, I completely get it. We walk around the building now with masks on uh, and you're, you know, they're white, so you come in, you come in every morning and the first thing I do is wipe down my keyboard and, and my desk and the mouse and everything, um, just, just to be safe, just to be you know, certain that I know it's clean and, and I'm the one who's touching this now. It's just, I think it's, you know, what folks everywhere are gonna do these days. You know, and logistically, it, it's definitely been more difficult, even as far as just figuring out the how to how to send files to each other and how to how to write in scripts remotely. All of these problems we have with the technical thing. But as far as storytelling goes, I feel like journalists have gotten more creative than we ever have before because we've been forced to. And what what sort of coverage do you think you guys are? What are you really proud of that you guys have done in the past couple of months? I think. Not stopping has been one of the, the most incredible things that, you know, this, this pandemic hit and we sort of saw it coming and then all of a sudden it was everybody stopped, do everything differently. And, you know, we're all, we're doing interviews on Zoom now and people figured out how to work that technology very quickly and, and you know, Skype interviews and, and now our photographers. And, you know, you, you gotta give credit to the photographers in, in this business who are literally doing the heavy lifting. And a lot of the creative things that are done in the field are coming out of their minds in terms of uh, now with all the logistics of just doing an interview. It used to be, you know, camera, microphone, photographer, reporter, go. Well, now it's, you know, boom mic and don't forget your mask and wipe down the microphone before the reporter touches it if you have a reporter with you. And sometimes it's, a photographer and an interviewee and a reporter on a phone asking questions. Uh, and it's just, you know, people have had to get really creative with just the, the basics of gathering uh, and then being able to actually put a story together. I think, you know, some of the, fortunately, for those of us who learn the art of storytelling, um, that doesn't change. You know, what's required of us in our writing uh, to be creative, to be succinct and, and to be uh, mindful of, of the people that we're talking about and talking to, uh, those things don't change. 
and, and everything else we figure out how to work around. Do you feel like, I know, notice from your Facebook page that you, you know, you interact with the audience quite a bit. Do you feel like they've come to rely on you in this whole new way during the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people are very early on, people were afraid. I mean, it was a scary situation because there was so much that we didn't know. And so we went to work every day knowing that, all right, whatever happened late last night, whatever new information is coming from the other side of the world in the middle of the night, uh, people are waking up wanting to know what else do we know? How can I make myself safer? When am I going to be able to get the things that I need? Uh, and those were questions that, that we feel a responsibility to try to get answers to. You don't always get all the answers right away, but our job is to keep digging and then to relay that information to people so that they can live their lives safely. And, and I don't think that that has really changed either, that, that, that core. You know, our job has always been to, it's particularly in local news, to give people the information that they need to get from waking up in the morning to going to bed at night and feeling safe and, and knowing where the money is being spent uh, and, and knowing the things that they're buying are safe. And, and every now and then, uh, you know, try to put a smile on people's face. That's, that's I think, as important, um, particularly for what we do with morning news, as important uh, as some of the information that we deliver, that we figure out a way to, to tell people that, you know what, the world is okay. We're all, you know, we're all in this together and, and we're gonna be okay, big um, picture long term. So here's something to smile about. Yeah, morning news has a, has an edge in that regard, just being able to, it, it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom. And in fact, it makes an effort to, to not be. Um, and perhaps we could be looking for more positive stories overall, but morning news, perhaps more than any other, has done a good job of highlighting the, the ha some of the people who are coming together, those heartwarming moments. There's been a lot of it. There's been a lot of other yeah. stuff too, but. <laughs> yeah, you actually, I mean, you talk about Facebook and, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a Facebook message or a tweet from somebody who says, you know, you gave me my first smile of the day. And, you know, I feel like that's as big a responsibility as anything else we do to figure out a way to say, you know what, here, you can still start your day with a smile. Maybe it's at my expense because I have no problem <laughs> sort of uh, making a little fun of myself when that's, when that's appropriate. But uh, yeah, you know, you, you try to give folks something to feel good about to start the day at least. Yeah, and people have had, a, I mean, it's been a heck of a year. 2020 is, 2020 is wild. Um, but besides the pandemic, you know, we have obviously the election happening. And then we also have these, you know, just massive social movement towards racial justice after the death of George Floyd. Um, and I know we've had protests here in Richmond. I know you've had protests up in D.C. And even though your newsroom isn't together as they normally would be, I imagine you guys have had a lot of conversations in the past couple of months, how do we cover this? Um, I mean, we've, we've covered plenty of protests as journalists before, but for some reason this feels a little bit different. And we're in this um, spot between police and protests and this big social movement. And how have you guys approached that? Because it, it, it's difficult to report on. You're, you're absolutely right. I think in one sense, you know, there is, we're covering events as they happen. Uh, and there's sort of a, a way that that's always been done and, and we continue to do it that way. But you're right, there's a, there's a, different, um, there's a different energy, there's a different sensitivity that we have to do the work with. Uh, you know, even in our newsroom, we've had, we've had meetings where, you know, let's talk about the issues that we feel exist in our space around racial equality, around gender equality around all these things that are now in the public sphere that we have to report on. Let's, let's look at ourselves a little bit and see, you know, where we are, what we can do better, and then look at our reporting. We've had opportunities to have uh, our managers examine the way that we've been covering stories, not just this summer, but over, over time, uh, and come up with some ways to say, you know what, make sure that we're, we're using language that actually communicates what it is that we're that we're trying to communicate and we're looking at this issue uh in, in the fairest way possible and, and talking about it in a way that um, actually serves some good that, that helps to further the conversations that are happening uh, we've done a couple of special programs uh, under 
uh, NBC News has this uh, Equality in America umbrella that they've been putting stories under, and so have we. Uh, and we've been, had a chance to look at what's, what's led up to the protests that we're seeing. Uh, what does it mean to defund the police? Uh, what's our history? I mean, a lot of people don't take, it, don't take the time to sit down and think back to, you know, how did we get where we are today? Where did we, where were the missteps? What can we do differently? Uh, and there are people who, there are voices that say, no, there's, there's not a problem. Um, these protests are all for naught. And, you know, there's, there's room for that in the conversation uh, in hopes that when the conversations end, and we are a long way from ending these conversations, but when they do end, uh, people come out with more knowledge than they had when they went in and the ability to, to create a, a world where, you know, we can all live equally and, and actually feel that. Yeah, you know, it's something that I, I get a lot when I talk to people. I study what people think of the news and, you know, typically that's why they dislike the media, the news, journalists. There's a lot that people don't understand about how newsrooms work. And I think one thing I would I love for people to know more about is that these conversations happen a lot. Um, journalists are nothing if they're not navel gazers, um, constantly thinking about you know, what you know, who are we? What are we doing? What's our purpose here? We feel very strongly about democracy. And um, it's interesting to hear you say that, you know, this has prompted some conversations in your own newsroom about like, well, I mean, this is something we all need to consider. This isn't just something we're reporting on. It's something that we're internalizing as well. Yeah, and I think it's important. We, we probably had those conversations to some degree in smaller circles or you know, with one employee to one manager. Um, but as of late, we've been having more sort of community conversations. Uh, and I think we're better, for, we're better, we're better able to do our jobs because we're taking time to, to examine our own lives and our own, you know, our own work setting um, so that we can you know, better understand what other people out in the world are talking about and dealing with and, and how it all fits in together. Um, I think Marcus has gotten a few questions from the audience. I'm seeing all of my notifications blow up on the Q&A. So Marcus, what do, you, what do you got for Aaron? Well, Aaron, first, first of all, I got to send you greetings from Paula Otto. <laughs> hey, Paula. <laughs> your, your old friend. And, yes. uh, and uh, she said, it's wonderful for you to be back at your alma mater. Of course, we're all happy that you're back. Yeah. Um, I have a question from uh, Gabriel Thomas, uh, one of our students. Um, he's asking, how did you balance school and work at age 19? Did you just go for it? Uh, that's a good question, you know, and I, I actually, at one point in my college career, I was working three part-time jobs and going to school full-time. Uh, I worked for the Richmond school system, I worked for Channel 12, and for a short time I worked for the Richmond Times Dispatch Radio uh, and was going to school full-time as well, you know, and I'm not, uh, I will admit that I didn't manage all of that uh, as well as you might hope uh, early on, um, but I eventually got it together and was able to do it all. I think, you know, you have to be willing in this line of work uh, to, to make some, some sacrifices. Uh, I think I only did spring break once <laughs> in my time at VCU because that week was a chance to be at the TV station more, work more hours there to get more experience. Uh, I always say that I was really fortunate to, to be working at a TV station and going to school at the same time because I would go to work and do the work and then come to, to class and learn why I was doing the work that I was doing the way that I was doing it. Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's just, I think it's a hunger thing. You have to be willing to put in the long, hard hours and, and have the sleepless nights. This is a, a business, uh, a line of work where it's very likely, uh, if you want to be successful, that you're gonna you're gonna put in some ugly hours and, and find yourself, uh, you know, sleeping in roach motels because <laughs> you've got to go somewhere crazy to cover a story. Uh, I've had a, I've had a few a few experiences where you know, wake up with a little friend on the wall beside you. <laughs> Right. I got another question from another student that goes in a similar direction. It's from uh, Fatima Bustos, and she asked, what do you think is the most important thing to remember about work ethic and education in general after graduating and the search for career opportunities? 
Um, what would you say to individuals who are trying to be more courageous uh, to build their experiences as you did? And then in parenthesis, big fan, by the way, since I was in elementary school. Oh, wow. <laughs> And you can let that part out, Marcus. <laughs> no, thank you for that, though. I appreciate that. Um, I think, you know, work ethic is, is a big part of success. You do have to be willing to do the hard work uh, and, and to, to find yourself in uncomfortable places uh, if you really want to be successful, I think. Um, you know, again, the long hours, the inconvenient hours, the, uh, you know, having to, to sit down with an editor uh, at crazy hours in the morning to, to talk through what a final package is going to look like. Um, those are all things that I think make you better at the job. And as you try to work your way up from, from a smaller market to a larger market or from, you know, from one job to the next, um, your, how hard you work shows in the work that you produce. Uh, and people recognize that. Uh, and, and quite frankly, sometimes you have to put it in people's face so that they recognize it. Um, but that's, that's sort of what the job calls for, I think, doing the hard work and then uh, not being afraid to sort of put yourself out there and say, hey, look at me, look what I've done, um, and, and, and taking advantage of every opportunity that comes your way. Great. Uh, here's, a, here's a question um, from, actually, from our namesake, um, uh, Mr. Richard Robertson, uh, Dick Robertson, uh, he's, uh, I'm sure he's watching us from California. Um, he says, uh, hi, Aaron, I too went to VCU. I too worked at Channel 12 while attending school. And I too went to Washington DC and worked at WRC TV4. We could not be more proud of you for what you've accomplished. And as a shining star alum of our great university, his question is, how do you keep whatever your political ideology is out of your straight news reporting? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, Dick, thank you. And, and it's, it's you know, thank you for tuning in for this and, uh, and for all that you've done for VCU over the years. Uh, you know, you, you were uh, a, a guiding presence for us when I was a student there. And, and I, I, so much of how we've grown, we I still consider myself a part of, <laughs> a part of VCU. So much of how we've grown uh, was under your guidance. So thank you for that. Um, you know, we, politics these days, it's just, it's a really different world, I think. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think anybody believes that we as journalists don't have uh, our own thoughts about what's happening in the world of politics. But it is important that we recognize that our job is to gather information, present facts, to offer intelligent analysis of the world that's happening around us uh, without infusing our own uh, biases and agendas and, and things like that. You know, we have opinions, uh, but they're largely things that we keep to ourselves. You know, I don't, I don't talk about my political um, feelings with anyone, period. You know, you won't overhear me in a, in a restaurant talking about something. Um, I, I, and I think that's important for my reporting um, to, to stay pure. Uh, it's, you know, I'm not going to pretend that that journalists have not been uh, made out to be the bad guys in, in recent years. That, that's a reality that we're all dealing with. That's a little bit harder to do our jobs because uh, we're sort of having to fight a narrative about fake news and, and, and things of that sort. Uh, when in reality, I believe that the overwhelming majority of journalists who value their jobs uh, value truth and honesty in reporting and don't go to bed at night thinking about, you know, how can I get one over on the people that are consuming the information that I'm putting out. Um, most of us, I, I really do believe, work hard to be, to be fair in our reporting uh, and to give people the information that they need to make their own decisions. Good. I got one more for now, and then I'm going to go back and uh, collect a couple more that are coming in now. Uh, here's actually one from uh, Paula Otto that we already mentioned a couple of times. Um, Aaron, having grown up in Northern Virginia, I know that the DC television media are often torn between national stations and local stations. How does NBC4 balance covering all of the federal national news and the local suburban news? Yeah, it's, it was a weird thing when I first got here. Um, and, and I thought, well, this is local TV. We're doing a lot of national stuff. And, and 
someone pointed out to me that, that in DC, national news is local news. Um, so much of, of what happens on Capitol Hill directly affects Washington, DC, uh, and the people who, who live in our viewing area work in Washington. Most of them, many of them work for the federal government in some capacity or another. And so covering national news, covering politics uh, in Washington is, is important local news. You know, obviously we get out into the suburbs uh, and cover what's happening closer to where people live, um, as, as all local TV stations do. Uh, and, and, and I would think that the majority of the reporting that we do would fit into that box, into what's happening in the neighborhoods and what's happening with the school systems in that community in Northern Virginia and, and, and Maryland. Um, but we, we also recognize the value in covering national stories, and it's a significant part of every single one of our news fans. Okay, so you mentioned the national versus local thing, and of course all, like you said, all national news is local in DC, and obviously the biggest story in DC is always politics. <laughs> you do a lot of political reporting, a lot of political anchoring. Um, you've been through quite a few presidential elections. 2016 was a whopper of an election um, for many, many reasons, some of which had to do with news coverage, others which had to do with polling, um, the candidates themselves who were just both lightning rods for criticism and scandals, and they were just very big characters, of yeah. stuff, right? So 2020 feels very different, probably because the context is so different because we've got natural disasters, racial protests, a pandemic, and then there's a oh, and also the 2020 election is happening. So how, how has coverage changed for you guys this year? You know, I think, I think just about everything is, is seen through the lens of the pandemic right now. Um, it, is, it is one thing that literally touches everybody. You know, we're all wearing masks or being asked to wear a mask and, and uh, everybody's talking about vaccines and everybody, you know, a lot of people know someone who, who's gotten sick or someone who's died. And so everything is sort of filtered through uh, the lens of, of the pandemic that we're dealing with right now. Uh, typically in a political season, running up to an election, you know, at this time of year, we would, we would have just come off the conventions. Uh, where the parties would have laid out their platforms and reporters would be talking to the candidates about, uh, you know, the economy and, and, and all the sorts of normal things that happen leading up to an election. How are you going to create more jobs and, and that sort of thing? And now it's, you know, the conversation is about vaccines and, and uh, you know, what Congress is going to do to make sure that, that there's funding to help small businesses because of the pandemic uh, and how are schools going to, going to open back up in a safe way. Uh, you know, these are all, everything kind of comes through this, the, the pandemic lens now. Uh, and there have been, depending on where you are in the country, there are people who try to change the, change the conversation, but it all goes back to that uh, one way or another. Uh, and so I think, you know, in, in covering local news for us, obviously you can't ignore that. I mean, we've, we've reshaped our newscast, recognizing that, you know, there's a need to cover the, the virus uh, and the pandemic, uh, and then everything else is is also a part of the newscast, if that, if that makes sense. And you guys are probably doing a lot of stories on um, voting and access to voting at this point in the run up to the election, because that is, it's always a very important issue. And perhaps maybe it's good that it's at the forefront of the conversation now. Um, have, you, have you guys been dedicating a lot of time to how that's gonna work come November 3rd? We have, and particularly because we cover we cover three states, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, and the rules are a little different. And uh, you know, the General Assembly of Virginia just uh, changed some of the rules around early voting and, and uh, mail-in ballots, and, and so that's a big part of our coverage. And part of our job is to explain that in a way that people um, can can sort of grasp the information and then actually use it in their lives. Um, we've always covered elections. We've always told people about voting. That's not new for us, but again, through the lens of the pandemic, things are happening differently. Uh, and part of our job is to make sure that we're clear on what people's options are. Um, I know I've done some, some things uh, that, we've, that we've run on our air just uh, as PSAs about here's what to do in Virginia, here's what to do in DC. 
Uh, next week, our, our station is hosting uh, the Senate debate between uh, Warner and Gade, and, and, and that's going to be a part of the conversation, um, you know, around voting security. And so it's all, it's all important, and it's all stuff that gets covered um, almost daily up here now. So one more question about the election, because I am a study media in politics, much to my students' disappointment, I can talk about <laughs> politics all day. Um, but then I want to talk to you about kind of advice you have for journalism students. But I do want to know, um, have you guys talked about your election day coverage? Normally we would have returns coming in. It's going to be really wacky this year. We're going to have a lot of early voting, a lot of mail-in voting. We're going to have to wait for some results. Have you guys talked about what's your plan going to be for election night? So it, it hasn't, we haven't uh, sort of laid out a plan for the, for the larger news, newsroom at this point, um, but we have a team of our, our editorial managers, our logistics, logistics managers are working together to figure out how we're going to cover that. Obviously, we're fortunate to be uh, uh, an NBC-owned station, and so the political unit for NBC News is in our building, and we're able to, to lean on them for covering some of the national stuff. Um, but we'll also have, you know, our reporters out, I think, all night, well into the, the wee hours of the morning. Um, if necessary, you know, we go on early and stay on late and do whatever it takes to cover the story. I, I don't believe that we'll have uh, clear answers everywhere by the time people wake up on November 4th. Uh, and so you know, that'll be an interesting story to have to tell, to, to figure out how we tell that story and all these numbers and make it make sense. Okay, we got some got some more questions. Uh, we got one uh, here in our Q and A from uh, Gabriel Thomas. He would like to know what advice you would give a junior um, who is at the Robertson School right now. And then in the in that kind of same realm, we have um, a question from a Twitter user, Milan Brewster. Ask, what is one essential thing a college student needs to do during that time at VCU to assure they are on the right path to this kind of career? Um, I, I This has not changed for me in, in all the time that I've been working in TV news. The, the, the first thing, the most important thing uh, to propel you up the ladder in your career is your writing. You know, you, you can you can fake it doing an interview. You can ask a million questions if you have to, uh, rather than you know, sort of asking two focused questions. But when it comes down to your writing, you 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 don't get to fake that. And it's important that you have a good grasp of the English language, and that you are able to put together a story in a way that is creative and compelling and, and makes people want to hear what you have to say. Um, and, and yeah, I, just, I can't stress that enough, that, that your ability to write, uh, to, to be a good storyteller, not just an information uh, regurgitator, if <laughs> that's a word, but you know, you have to be a good storyteller. You have to be able to weave together uh, details in a way that, that make people want to watch your story. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. Uh, and then, you know, when it comes to getting out there and looking for that first job, um, I find myself telling college students now to be realistic. Um, it's, not, it's not unheard of to have someone come out of college and go to work in a big market, but it's not the typical story either. Um, and, and, and I know people who have, have gone to work in certain places and realized in a, in a, in a bad way that they had bitten off more than they could chew. There's nothing wrong with going to a small market and, and cutting your teeth and figuring out how it's all done uh, and, and then moving up from there. Um, that's, that's the way that, that most of us do it. Uh, and most of us are better for it. You'll have uh, a news director in a small market who understands that he's got to work with you and, and will help you refine your writing ability. Uh, if you're a photographer, you know, there'll be some photographers who've been around for a while who can teach you the, the tricks of the trade. Um, and even, you know, for producers who you guys are, are in a lot of ways, the decision makers on, a, on an hour to hour basis. Um, and so getting into a space where you can learn the ropes and then move up, I think is the best way to do it. Uh, but don't, don't necessarily shy away from that, that reach goal either. Uh, if, you're, if you're sending your tape out to, to five different stations, 
And one of them is in New York City? Sure. Go for it. <laughs> one of them. I'm all five. You, uh, Aaron, you, you still have a lot of uh, fans in, in Richmond, so we also get a lot of fan mail here, fan posts uh, for you. I appreciate so, that. <laughs> our colleague, um, Judy Cranshaw, who is a professor here in the school now, says uh, that RBA misses you very much. <laughs> she wants to know um, that, uh, or she says that she loves uh, how you emphasize the importance of writing concisely. And uh, do you still write all of your own stories? Uh, so, for the newscast that I anchor, I don't write much of that content. I probably rewrite more of it than, than the writers would like me to do. Uh, but, you know, there's some value in, in making sure that, that you're, as an anchor, making sure that your, your scripts are in, in your voice. Uh, they sound like something you would say and, and sort of fit with, with my cadence and, and that sort of thing. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm producing a story, if I'm, if I'm producing a package, yeah, that's usually I will have done the interviews uh, and I do 99% of my own writing for that sort of stuff. Uh, which is important to me. I, I um, have been on the anchor desk in DC uh, for our morning show for eight years now, but I still get out in the field and do interviews. I still go out when there's, well, I used to, <laughs> pre-pandemic, I would still get out to cover big stories. Uh, I think we had just had the debate in Las Vegas, the Democratic debate in Las Vegas in February before the pandemic sort of shut everything down. Uh, I spent a few days out there covering that, so um, yeah, it's still important to me to, to keep my hands dirty. Great. Uh, we got lots of questions coming in. Here's one uh, uh, from Tim Corley. He's asking, um, what would you say is the most valuable lesson you learned while at VCU that you still practice today? Well, one of the most valuable things I learned early on is to remember that in the course of doing our work, we are dealing with real people. We are doing stories about real people, about their real lives, and there's value in remembering that and, and trying to approach our jobs with compassion. There is often this push to get things first, uh, to get the big interview, to, to push your way through the crowd to, to ask this question uh, or that, and, and you just, you can't, you can't forget that, that when you go to the scene of a shooting, and you want to get an interview with a grieving family member, that person has just gone through an incredible trauma. And we can't, you can't just sort of push your way in and shove a microphone in their face and start barking questions. Uh, you have to recognize that this is a real person who's dealing with a real trauma. And how can you approach that compassionately? Uh, and sometimes that means accepting, no, I will not talk to you and saying, I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you for your time. Uh, so I think compassion was one of the big things that I learned in, in this job early on. Okay. Um, a question from uh, Yvonne. Uh, how, has the broad how has broadcast journalism changed over your career? For instance, the speed of the news cycle, the technology, the role in society, and so on. Yeah, I think the biggest thing has been the technology. And it's, there, <laughs> things were, you know, when I started out, Folks who've been around for a while would tell me about the way they used to do things, and it seems so so far in the past. And now I think about the 20 years that I've been in in TV news and the way technology has changed. You know, even today I'll, I'll you know, talk to a photographer, and it's like, oh, we don't shoot on that anymore. It's you know, it's a, a little tiny card. And when I was at VCU, we still had to lug around, you know, <laughs> all sorts of heavy equipment, and and uh, I remember editing tape to tape as opposed to on a computer, which is the way we do it now. Um, so I think the technology has been the biggest thing. You know, I, I, it, it used to be that if you did a live report, you had a microwave truck or a satellite truck, and that was it. And now, you know, I, I anchored entire newscasts using my phone uh, remotely. And uh, I, I'm working here in DC, had to go to Richmond to do, I remember the shock of smart days. <sighs> had to come to Richmond to cover some of the basketball uh, uh, games a few years back, and it was in a backpack. We got in a car and we just went with a backpack, and that was the technology needed to go live. So the technology has really, uh, really changed the way that we do our, our work, I think, um, 
that's probably been the biggest the biggest observation I've had about change in the industry. Okay. Um, Fatima Bustos is uh, asking, do you have any inspirations in media or in general that motivate you to keep working and growing? Any inspirations? Uh, in uh, that, keep you, just... that keep you going. What inspires you to keep you going and to keep growing as a, as a journalist? You know, I, I do, I deep down in my heart believe that we are doing important work. We are doing valuable work. Um, we are holding people accountable, holding the powerful accountable. Uh, we, we live in a democracy where we decide that we want people to represent our interests. And as members of the news media, part of our job is to, to watch those people to make sure that they're doing the work that, that, that the citizenry has asked them to do. Um, we have an important function in that way. I think uh, the stories that we cover, particularly in, in, in local news, touch people's everyday lives. Uh, and so I, I think that, that is sort of what drives me from one day to the next, remembering that there's the potential for great value in the work that we do every day. Uh, and that it, it matters to people. Uh, yeah, and I think that's just important to keep in the back of your mind. So a question from uh, Tim Corley, uh, who is asking, what has been your uh, biggest struggle you've had to deal with during this entire pandemic? Uh, professionally, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, I think like it is for everybody else. Just it's, it's weird to go into a workspace uh, where you're used to dealing with people. And, and again, I believe that our business is one that's, that's very collaborative. Uh, where you get around a table and, and you get around ideas and, and, and now it's harder. It's not impossible, but it's harder to do that. Uh, you can't look somebody in the eye and, and, and sort of figure out what they're thinking in the way that you used to be able to. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's been challenging to figure out how to do everything that, that we've always done in a different way, in a, in a virtual way, <laughs> you know, through a computer or over the phone. Uh, that's, that's been a challenge. I think, um, you know, there are people smarter than me who are figuring out, figuring out great ways to, 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 to meet those challenges. Um, and, you know, you can only hope that, that either it'll get easier or this will be behind us uh, before too long. Uh, our, our audience is really active to, tonight. Um, so, but here, here we have the, the, um, the last audience questions uh, from another student, Zachary Klosko. I'm entering my senior year in the VCU journalism program, but I'm, I'm a bit worried about finding a job, especially with all of the layoffs in journalism outlets, and the way the market is changing. With an increasing number of people consuming news digitally as opposed to in newspapers or by watching television newscasts, how are news stations keeping up with the times and continuing to connect with their changing audiences? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. You make a, a, a really good point. Um, <clears throat> we have to remember that, that this industry, uh, it's a business and, and TV stations are, are business entities that have to figure out ways to, to, to make money and to, uh, to, to, to stay afloat in a lot of cases. And so it's been tough for folks who've been laid off. I, I have friends and, and former colleagues who are no longer working uh, and getting new jobs is something that's just going to be difficult for, for a lot of people uh, going forward. You guys coming out of school, you know, again, it's, it's going to be giving yourself a little wiggle room. Sometimes folks think, oh, I'm going to go straight to the top will recognize that that sometimes it's just from a, an employment perspective, it's about finding a job as opposed to the job uh, right now. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't say that to be uh, to sort of you know, deal a blow to anyone's confidence, but uh, the reality is that we are in a tough job market right now. Uh, and you have to figure out creative ways to, to, to deal with that in your own personal situation. Um, the, the business is moving into the digital space, into, into the, uh, and has been for a long time. You know, you guys now are coming out of VCU multimedia journalists. You're, you literally can do it all. And in, in a lot of cases, you'll have to do it all if you want to be successful or, or you know, the, the folks who have better, who have more diversified skill sets are the ones who are going to get the jobs. Um, I think Particularly at the, the national level, you think you look at TV networks uh, and, and how they've expanded 
their news products onto their websites and into, uh, into streaming services. I think that is something that is going to continue to grow. Uh, people, people, there's a greater interest now, I think, for in-depth reporting. Um, and, and the digital space is, is great for that. People can sort of do things at their own, at their own leisure. Uh, but they want stories that are detailed and, uh, and they want to see reporters um, sort of build stories around characters uh, and you know, not to call the people that we do stories about characters, but in the interest of, of explaining how we do storytelling, characters. Um, and, and so I think that the, the digital space is going to lend itself to do that. You know, if, if someone approaches you about a job uh, or you, you learn about a job that, that puts you in a streaming atmosphere or in some of the digital space as opposed to on TV uh, or on the radio, uh, don't turn your nose up at it. The industry is more and more in that direction. All right, that was all the uh, audience questions. And we're wrapping up here. We just have a few minutes left. But like any good tag uh, package, we include forward-facing information. So yeah. we'll tag this with a question looking into the future. And that is, where do you, what do you hope to see in a couple years from journalism? What do you think? Um, what do you hope changes um, for the better? And that uh, the, the journalists coming out of our journalism program now, you know, what do you think they're infusing into newsrooms moving forward? I think, you know, in some ways, diversity has become a bit of a buzzword, but I, I think it's important that newsrooms are looking at their composition and figuring out how to make sure they're, there are spaces where there are lots of different voices that are part of the conversation, uh, that are furthering the conversation, um, that, are, that are touching communities so that our, our newsrooms and our reporting looks more like uh, the communities that we're working in. Uh, and I think that, it's, that we all have a, a role to play in, in pushing that forward. Uh, it's not simply you know, managers need to, to count people, but we actually have to say, hey, how are we covering this type of story uh, and who's covering it and, and what do they bring to the table from their life experience that can make our storytelling better, that can make our news organizations better. Um, so, so there's value in speaking up. There's also value in, in understanding how to speak up. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a lot easier to affect change uh, when you're having uh, a, a dialogue as opposed to uh, uh, a monologue, I guess, <laughs> or, yeah, so telling folks what to do. So I, I think there's there's a challenge for all of us going into the future to figure out how do we uh, how do we continue to do great storytelling, important storytelling, uh, in a way that that really reflects the communities that we're working in uh, and, and serves our viewers um, in in the ways that they say that they need. Uh, and that will change too over time. The, the communities that we serve change and we have to be uh, nimble enough to evolve with them. Aaron, the DC market is so lucky to have you. you very clearly care very deeply about our profession and what we do on a day to day basis. And we're very proud to call you a Robertson School graduate. I'm so Thank happy you. to take the time to talk with us. Absolutely. Thank you again for uh, for inviting me and Marcus for inviting me. Um, like I said, when when things get a little more normal, I intend to be on campus. So, um, uh, you know, there are still a lot of familiar faces around there. I'd love to say hi to and, uh, and, and maybe we can have a conversation like this in person. You are you are welcome home anytime. We would be happy to have you. Thank you for joining in, everybody. I'm going to leave this meeting and that will end it for everyone. Aaron, it was so wonderful talking to you. Aaron Gilchrist, everybody. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs>